Welcome to Dwell in the Word this 23rd day of December. Hope your holiday plans are coming together despite the nasty weather out there. Today we're going to be finishing up chapter 41 of Isaiah. But first, it is Friday, and so that means a prayer from piercing heaven. Let us pray. Give me faith, Lord, or I die. I may live without friends, wealth, honors, or pleasures, but I cannot live without faith. There is nothing but death for me in unbelief. Lord, whatever you deny me, do not deny me faith. I am lost, undone, I perish. I am a dead man without faith. It would have been better if I had never been born than to live in unbelief. Your wrath would weigh on me while I lived in this horrible state, and it would be that way forever. I will never see life unless I believe. There is no hope for me until then. My case is miserable and desperate until I believe, and I can never believe unless you give me faith. Lord, give me faith, or else I die. It is miserable to be excluded from life. To be dead while I live, unless you give me faith, I will never see life. What misery it is to be under divine wrath. How unavoidable the misery of those who are under abiding wrath. What joy can I have in any enjoyment when your wrath is mixed with all? What comfort can my life be to me if your wrath hangs continually over me? Lord, hear me. Bring my soul out of this mire and clay, out of unbelief, out of the pit where there is no water, no comfort, no refreshment, and no relief. You take no pleasure in the misery of wretched creatures. It is no delight to you that I am miserable, but rather that I should live. Lord, give me faith, or else I will never see life. Give me faith or else I will be forever miserable. Amen. As I said, we are finishing up Isaiah chapter 41 today. We have before us verse 21 through verse 29. Hear the word of the Lord. Set forth your case, says the Lord. Bring your proofs, says the king of Jacob. Let them bring them and tell us what is to happen. Tell us the former things, what they are, that we may consider them, that we may know their outcome, or declare to us the things to come. Tell us what it is, what is to come hereafter, that we may know that you are gods. Do good or do harm, that we may be dismayed and terrified. Behold, you are nothing, and your work is less than nothing. An abomination is he who chooses you. I stirred up one from the north, and he has come, from the rising of the sun, and he shall call upon my name. He shall trample on rulers as on mortar, as the potter treads clay. Who declares it from the beginning, that we might know, and beforehand that we might say, He is right. There was none who declared, none who proclaimed, none who heard your words. I was the first to say to Zion, Behold, here they are, and I give to Jerusalem a herald of good news. But when I look, there is no one. Among those there is no counselor who, when I ask, gives an answer. Behold, they are all a delusion. Their works are nothing. Their metal images are empty wind. As we have been moving through these stories in Isaiah of judgment and the story of God's salvation from that judgment, we've also seen a war between the true God and the gods of the nations. We saw this back when one of the kings said, hey, all the other people said their gods would protect them, but they didn't. And the response was, hey, God is sovereign. Uh, He is the one who has put you over these people for a time uh, to judge them, but then he is going to come in judgment on you. And so we've had this war between God, the one true God, and the gods of the nations. And this idea is Uh, continuing here in this end to chapter 41. We see this here in verse 23. Tell us what is to come hereafter, that we may know that you are God, to do do good or do harm, that we may be dismayed or terrified. In other words, God is saying, or the prophet is saying, God is saying through the prophet Isaiah, hey, predict the future here. If you can do something regarding what is going to happen, whether good or harm, then we can either be dismayed, we can be terrified, um, but we'll know that you are speaking. God is speaking through the prophet, and what is coming to pass is showing that he is in fact God. But notice the next verse in verse 24, behold, you are nothing, and your work is less than nothing. An abomination is he who chooses you. So it's not just that these false gods 
are, are bad. The ones who choose them over the one true God are an abomination themselves. And we get this idea as it continues. We understand this. And we see that Isaiah is letting us know this truth, that there are no other gods. They are nothing. We see this in verse 29. Behold, they are all a delusion. Their works are nothing. Their metal images are empty wind. You got to love what Isaiah is saying there. It's like, hey, they are nothing. They're a delusion. They don't do anything. But this imagery here that is so strong is their metal images are empty wind. It's, it's easy to say that an idol is something, right? It's, it's physical. I can touch it. I can handle it. Uh, it um, I can kick it over. I can throw it down the street. Uh, I can put it on the, the shelf. I can do all kinds of things with it. But what does Isaiah say? He says, hey, even the metal images, the ones that will last, the ones that you know can be put in the ground and will be there in, in a thousand years, even those images are nothing but wind. They're nothingness. Isaiah is asserting the power of the one true God, the one that we are not to make idols in order to worship, this one who the his word is what we use to understand who he is. He reveals himself to us in that way. We don't have images, but he is something. He is substantial. His word goes forth. It comes to pass. He is the true power. But these images that they can touch, they are the wind. That's a strong imagery. It reminds us that no matter what they would build up, no matter how big they would make them, no matter how long they would last, their works are nothing. In fact, it says earlier in this chapter, they're more than nothing. They just sit there. There is nothing to them. And this is always a good reminder to us. We've seen this in other parts of Isaiah, but it's a good reminder for us again today. We don't need idols. We don't need images to be able to worship our God. He is the God who has spoken in history. He has revealed himself to us in his word. What he has declared has come to pass. He is the true God. He is from everlasting to everlasting. We don't need images. We worship him rightly when we worship him in spirit and in truth. But at the same time, we like images. We like things we can see. We like idols, don't we? Uh, as much as we like to think we don't, we all have things in our lives that, that we place above God or images that we have in our mind that maybe uh, cause us to not worship God correctly. And so it's important that we put those things aside and we remember the God who has spoken in his word, who has revealed himself in that way. And so if we want to worship God rightly and follow him rightly, it is important that we know his word. We know how he has been revealed to us, that we might worship him in spirit and truth as we are called to do. So as we prepare for this holiday weekend, as we prepare to consider the works of God in the coming days, may we remember how he has revealed this truth to us in his word, and may we worship him in spirit and in truth. Let's close up with prayer. Gracious Lord, we know that you alone are God. All idols are worthless. They are a delusion and their work is less than nothing, and they are an abomination to those who trust in them. They are but an empty wind. Grant us the faith to put aside all falsehood that we might faithfully live for you and witness to your saving work. As we approach this holiday weekend, we bring you praise for the coming of Jesus in our very own flesh. We know that our fall into sin was in the flesh, and so Jesus became a man to bear the wrath of God that we deserve for our sin. Grant that our celebration of Christmas this year would be rooted in the joy that you've given us in the salvation won for us by the one who left heaven to save us. And so we ask that you would bless us this day as we move about to be with family and friends. May you grant journey mercies to your people through this Christmas season. We pray this all in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. All right, that has us through chapter 41 of Isaiah. We'll move on to chapter 42 on Monday. Have yourself a very good Christmas.